than understanding, and less than perception. He should have started with a more general neutral term to express the synthetic concrescence whereby the many things of the universe become the one actual entity. Accordingly I have adopted the term less than prehension, to express the activity whereby an actual entity affects its own concretion of other things. 82 for less than prehension, of one actual entity by another actual entity is the complete transaction, analyzable into the objectification of the former entity is one of the data for the latter, and into the fully clothed feeling whereby the datum is absorbed into the subjective satisfaction less than clothed, with the various elements of its less than subjective form. But this definition can be stated more generally so as to include the case of the prehension of an eternal object by an actual entity, namely, the less than positive prehension of an entity by an actual entity is the complete transaction analyzable into the ingression or objectification of that entity as a datum for feeling and into the feeling whereby this datum is absorbed into the subjective satisfaction. I also discard Locke's term less than idea. Instead of that term, the other things, in their limited roles as elements for the actual entity in question, are called less than objects for that thing. There are four main types of objects, namely, less than eternal objects, less than propositions, less than objectified, actual entities and nexus. These less than eternal objects are Locke's ideas as explained in his essay 2, I, 1T where he writes, Idea is the O, ECT of thinking, every man being conscious to himself that he thinks, and that which his mind is applied about, whilst thinks. In, being the ideas that are there, it is cast doubt that men have in their mind several ideas, such as air as those expressed by the words, whiteness, hardness, sweetness, thinking, motion, man, elephant, army, drunkenness, and others. Related 3, 3, Two, when discussing general terms, and subconsciously, earlier in his discussion of less than substance, in 2, 23, he adds parenthetically another type of ideas which are practically what I term less than objectified actual entities and less than nexus. He calls them less than ideas of particular things, and he explains why, in general, such ideas cannot have their separate names. The reason is simple and undeniable. There are too many actual entities. He writes, H but it is beyond the power of human capacity. To frame and retain distinct ideas of all the particular things we meet with, Every bird and beast men saw, 83 every tree and plant that affected the senses, could not find a place in the most capacious understanding. The context shows that it is not the impossibility of and less than idea, of any particular thing which is the seat of the difficulty, it is solely their number. This notion of a direct less than idea, or less than feeling, of an actual entity is a presupposition of all common sense, Santayana ascribes it to less than animal faith. But it accords very ill with the sensationalist theory of knowledge which can be derived. Fact and form, 53, from other parts of Locke's writings. Both Locke and Descartes wrestle with exactly the same difficulty. The principle that I am adopting is that consciousness presupposes experience, and not experience consciousness. It is a special element in the subjective forms of some feelings. Thus an actual entity may, or may not, be conscious of some part of its experience. 
This experience is its complete formal constitution, including its consciousness, if any. Thus, in Locke's phraseology, its ideas of particular things are those other things exercising their function as felt components of its constitution. Locke would only term them ideas when these objectifications belong to that region of experience lit up by consciousness. In section 40 of the same chapter, he definitely makes all knowledge to be founded in particular things. He writes, Yet a distinct name for every particular thing would not be of any great use for the improvement of knowledge, which, though founded in particular things, 16 enlarges itself by general views, to which things reduced into certs under general names, are properly subservient. Thus for Locke, in this passage, there are not first the qualities and then the conjectural particular things, but conversely. Also he illustrates his meaning of a particular thing by a leaf, a crow, a sheep, a grain of sand. So he is not thinking of a particular patch of color, a other sense datum point 17 for example, 84 in section 7 of the same chapter, in reference to children he writes, the ideas of the nurse and the mother are well framed in their minds, and, like pictures of the mare, represent only those individuals. This doctrine of Locke's must be compared with Descartes' doctrine of Rila de Eo, Activa. Locke inherited the dualistic separation of mind from body. One count he had started with the one fundamental notion of an actual entity, F. The complex of ideas disclosed in consciousness would have at once turned into the complex constitution of the actual entity disclosed in its own consciousness, so far as it is conscious fitfully, partially, or not at all. Locke definitely states how ideas become general. In section 6 of the chapter he writes, and ideas become general by separating from them the circumstances of time, and place, and any other ideas that may determine them to this or that particular existence. Thus for Locke the abstract idea is preceded by the idea of a particular existence. Children frame an idea which they find those many particulars to partake in. This statement of Locke's should be compared with the category of conceptual valuation, which is the fourth categorial obligation. Locke discusses the constitution of actual things under the term, real essences. He writes section 15, T same chapter, and thus the real in. 16. My italics. 17 is he is an I, 2, 15, where he writes, the senses at first let in particular ideas, and furnish the yet empty cabinet. Note the distinction between particular ideas and ideas of particular things. Discussions and applications. 54. Turn all but generally in substances unknown constitution of things, whereon their discoverable qualities depend, may be called their essence. The point is that Locke entirely endorses the doctrine that an actual entity arises out of a complex constitution involving other entities, though, t by his unfortunate use of such terms as cabinet, he puts less emphasis on the notion of process than does H. Hume. Locke has in fact stated in his work one main problem for the philosophy of organism. He discovers that the mind is a unity arising out of the active prehension of ideas into one concrete thing. Unfortunately, 
he presupposes both the Cartesian dualism whereby minds are one kind of particulars, and natural entities are another kind 85 of particulars, and also the subject predicate dogma. He is thus, in company with Descartes, driven to a theory of representative perception. For example, in one of the quotations already cited, T. He writes, and, like pictures of the mayor, represent only those individuals. This doctrine obviously creates an insoluble problem for epistemology, only to be solved either by some sturdy make-believe of animal faith, with Santayana, or by some doctrine of illusoriness, some doctrine of mere appearance, inconsistent if taken as real with Bradley. Anyhow, representative perception can never, within its own metaphysical doctrines, produce the title deeds to guarantee the validity of the representation of fact by idea. Locke and the philosophers of his epoch the 17th and 18th centuries are misled by one fundamental misconception. It is the assumption, unconscious and uncriticized, that logical simplicity can be identified with priority in the process constituting an experient equation. Locke founded the first two books of his essay on this presupposition, with that exception of his early sections on substance, which are quoted immediately below. In the third and fourth books of the essay he abandons this presupposition, again unconsciously as it seems. This identification of priority in logic with priority in practice has vitiated thought and procedure from the first discovery of mathematics and logic by the Greeks. For example, some of the worst defects in educational procedure have been due to it. Locke's nearest approach to the philosophy of organism, and from the point of view of that doctrine his main oversight, are best exemplified by the first section of his chapter, of our complex ideas of substances, 2, 23, 1. He writes, the mind, being, as I have declared, furnished with a great number of the simple ideas conveyed in by the senses, as they are found in exterior things, or by reflection on its own operations, takes notice, also, that a certain number of these simple ideas go constantly together, 86 which being presumed to belong to one thing, and words being suited to common apprehensions, and made use of for quick dispatch, are called, so united in one subject, by one name, which, by inadvertency, we are apt afterward to talk of and consider as one simple idea, which indeed is a complication of many ideas together, because, fact and form, 55, as I have said, not imagining how these simple ideas can subsist by themselves, we accustom ourselves to suppose some substratum wherein they do subsist, and from which they do result, which therefore we call, substance. In this section, Locke's first statement, which is the basis of the remainder of the section, is exactly the primary assumption of the philosophy of organism, the mind, being, furnished with a great number of the simple ideas conveyed in by the senses, as they are found in exterior things. Here the last phrase, as they are found in exterior things, asserted what later I shall call the vector character of the primary feelings. The universals involved obtain that status by reason of the fact that, they are found in exterior things. This is Locke's assertion and it is the assertion of the philosophy of organism. It can also be conceived as a development of Descartes' doctrine of relativism objectiva.
The universals are the only elements in the data describable by concepts, because concepts are merely the analytic functioning of universals. But the exterior things, although they are not expressible by concepts in respect to their individual particularity, are no less data for feeling, so that the concrescent actuality arises from feeling their status of individual particularity, and thus that particularity is included as an element from which feelings originate, and which they concern. The sentence later proceeds with, a certain number of these simple ideas go constantly together. This can only mean that in the immediate perception, a certain number of these simple ideas are found together in an exterior thing, and that the recollection of antecedent moments of X fairy. Ence discloses that the same fact, of 87 togetherness in an exterior thing, holds for the same set of simple ideas. Again, the philosophy of organism agrees that this description is true for moments of immediate experience. But Locke, owing to the fact that he veils his second premise under the phrase, go constantly together, omits to consider the question whether the exterior things of the successive moments are to be identified. The answer of the philosophy of organism is that, in the sense in which Locke is here speaking, the exterior things of successive moments are not to be identified with each other. Each exterior thing is either one actual entity, or more frequently, is a nexus of actual entities with immediacies mutually contemporary. For the sake of simplicity we will speak only of the simpler case where the exterior thing means one actual entity at the moment in question. But what Locke is explicitly concerned with is the notion of the self-identity of the one enduring physical body which lasts for years, or for seconds, or for ages. He is considering the current philosophical notion of an individualized particular substance, in the Aristotelian sense, which undergoes adventures of change, retaining its substantial form amid transition of accidents. Throughout his essay, he in effect retains this notion while rightly insisting on its vagueness and obscurity. He, philosophy of organism agrees with Locke and Hume, that the non in 56. Discussions and Applications Individualized substantial form is nothing else than the collect icon of universals are, more accurately, the one complex universal common to the succession of exterior things at successive moments respectively. In other words, an exterior thing is either one actual entity or is a society with a defining characteristic. For the organic philosophy, these exterior things in the former sense are the final concrete actualities. Tile individualized substance of lock must be construed to be the historic root constituted by some society of fundamental, exterior things, stretching from the first, thing, to the last, thing. 88 But Locke, throughout his essay, rightly insists that the chief ingredient in the notion of, substance, is the notion of, power. The philosophy of organism holds that, t in order to understand, power, we must have a correct notion of how each individual actual entity contributes to the datum from which its successors arise and to which they must conform. The reason why the doctrine of power is peculiarly relevant to the enduring things, which the philosophy of Locke's day conceived as individualized substances, 
is that any likeness between the successive occasions of a historic group procures a corresponding identity between their contributions to the datum of any subsequent actual entity, and it therefore secures a corresponding intensification in the imposition of conformity. The principle is the same as that which holds for the more sporadic occasions in empty space, but the uniformity along the historic route increases the degree of conformity which that route exacts from the future. In particular each historic route of like occasions tends to prolong itself, by reason of the weight of uniform inheritance derivable from its members. The philosophy of organism abolishes the detached mind. Mental activity is one of the modes of feeling belonging to all actual entities in some degree, but only amounting to conscious intellectuality in some actual entities. This higher grade of mental activity is the intellectual self-analysis of the entity in an earlier stage of incompletion, effected by intellectual feelings produced in a later stage of concrescence. Point one eight. The perceptive constitution of the actual entity presents the problem, how can the other actual entities, each with its own formal existence, also and tilde R objectively into the perceptive constitution of the actual entity in question. This is the problem of the solidarity of the universe. The classical doctrines of universals and particulars, of subject and predicate, of individual substances not present in other individual substances, of 89 the externality of relations, alike render this problem incapable of solution. The answer given by the organic philosophy is the doctrine of prehensions, involved in concrescent integrations, and terminating in a definite, complex unity of feeling. To be actual must mean that all actual things are alike objects, enjoying objective immortality and fashioning creative actions, and that all actual things are subjects, each prehending the universe from which. 18 CF. Part 3. CH. D. Fact and Form. 57 It arises. The creative action is the universe always becoming one in a particular unity of self-experience, and thereby adding to the multiplicity which is the universe as many. This insistent concrescence into unity is the outcome of the ultimate self-identity of each entity. No entity be it, universal, or, particular, can play disjoined roles. Self-identity requires that every entity have one conjoined, self-consistent function, whatever be the complexity of that function. Section 7. There is another side of Locke, which is his doctrine of power. This doctrine is a better illustration of his admirable adequacy than of his consistency. There is no escape from Hume's demonstration that no such doctrine is compatible with a purely sensationalist philosophy. The establishment of such a philosophy, though derivative from Locke, was not his explicit purpose. Every philosophical school in the course of its history requires two presiding philosophers. One of them under the influence of the main doctrines of the school should survey experience with some adequacy, but inconsistently. The other philosopher should reduce the doctrines of the school to a rigid consistency, he will thereby effect a reductio ad absurdum. No school of thought has performed its full service to philosophy until these men have appeared. In this way the school of sensationalist empiricism derives its importance from Locke and Hume. Locke introduces his doctrine of power, as follows 2, 21, 1 to 3 t.
this idea how God, the mind being 90 every day and formed, by the senses, of the alteration of those simple ideas it observes in things without, and taking notice how one comes to an end and ceases to be, and another begins to exist which was not before, reflecting also on what passes within itself, and observing a constant change of its ideas, sometimes by the impression of outward objects on the senses, and sometimes by the determination of its own choice, and concluding, from what it has so constantly observed to have been, that the like changes will for the future be made in the same things by like agents, and by the like ways, considers in one thing the possibility of having any of its simple ideas changed, and in another the possibility of making that change, and so comes by that idea which we call, power. Thus we say, fire has a power to melt gold, and gold has a power to be melted. In which in that like cases, the power we consider is in reference to the change of perceivable ideas, for we cannot observe any alteration to be made in, or operation upon, anything, but by the observable change of its sensible ideas, nor conceive any alteration to be made, but by conceiving a change of some of its ideas. Power thus considered is twofold, viz. As able to make, or able to receive, any change, the one may be called, active, and the other, passive, power. I confess power includes in it some kind. 58. Discussions and Applications Of relation, a relation to action or change, as, indeed, which of our ideas, of what kind soever, when attentively considered, does not. For our ideas of extension, duration, and number, do they not all contain in them a secret relation of the parts? Figure and motion have something relative in them much more visibly. And sensible qualities, as colors and smells, etc., what are they but the powers of difference? bodies in relation to our perception. Our idea therefore of power, I think, may well have a place amongst other simple ideas, and be considered as one of them, being one of those that make a principal ingredient in our complex ideas of substances, as we shall hereafter have occasion to observe. 91. In this important passage, Locke enunciates the main doctrines of the philosophy of organism, namely, the principle of relativity, the relational character of eternal objects, whereby they constitute the forms of the objectifications of actual entities for each other, the composite character of an actual entity i.e., a substance the notion of power, is making a principal ingredient in that of actual entity substance. In this latter notion, Locke adumbrates both the ontological principle, and also the principle that the power of one actual entity on the other is simply how the former is objectified in the constitution of the other. Thus the prob lem of perception and the problem of power are one and the same, at least. So far as perception is reduced to mere prehension of actual entities. Perception, in the sense of consciousness of such prehension, requires the additional factor of the conceptual prehension of eternal objects, and a process of integration of the two factors d. Part 3. Locke's doctrine of power is reproduced in the philosophy of organism by the doctrine of the two types of objectification, namely, a causal objectification and F.J. presentational objectification. In causal objectification, 
what is felt subjectively by the objectified actual entity is transmitted objectively to the concrescent actualities which supersede it. In Locke's phraseology the objectified actual entity is then exerting power. In this